It's time for the three question more for Biochem 2. Let's get going. Which antibiotic matches each of the following descriptions? First one here is inhibits 50S uh, peptidyl transferase, that's going to be chloramphenicol. Binds the 50S and it's going to block translocation, that's going to be the macrolides, lincomycin, clindamycin, and the uh, streptogramins. Binds the 30S, that's going to be prevent attachment of tRNA, that's going to be tetracyclines. Inhibits prokaryotic RNA polymerase, that's going to be rifampin. Inhibits prokaryotic topoisomerase, that's going to be the fluoroquinolones. And then inhibits prokaryotic uh, dihydrofolate reductase, that's going to be trimethoprim. Next question, what are the different causes of post-op fever? So there's a bunch of them here, but the ones we try to remember are the W. So that's wind, water, wound, uh, walking, and wonder drugs. Uh, so we said that wind is pneumonia, which is usually not uh, the first day po-op, but maybe a few days after uh, post-op. Water is uh, supposed to make you think of a UTI, especially if they're indwelling fully. Uh, wound is wound infection. That's, again, typically not uh, going to pop up uh, in the first few days, but maybe at least day five, somewhere around there. And then walking is for DVT. Next question. A patient presents complaining of pain in the right upper quadrant uh, that he can point to with one finger. The area is tender to light touch, and pain is worsened when the patient is asked to raise his arms above his head. What is most uh, likely this patient's problem? So you know that this isn't a, a visceral pain. Visceral pain is not something that you can point to with one finger. So it, it may be confined to a single quadrant, uh, but it's not really focally localized. Uh, so gallbladder pain is right upper quadrant pain. Appendicitis is pain over the uh, uh, right lower quadrant. Diverticulitis, generally left lower quadrant pain. Ectopic pregnancy can be uh, left or right lower quadrant pain. But pain of the viscera is either generalized or localized only to quadrants. So if you have pain that can, uh, you can point to with one figure, that is not visceral pain. This is more of a musculoskeletal pain. So this might be a rectus abdominis tear, uh, which could present uh, in this way as well. That's going to be it for the warm-up. Let's get to that lecture now. In some of the earlier videos, I said some pretty mean things about Dr. Lewis. Then later I felt bad about it, so I apologized. But he said he would only accept my apology if I let him hit me in the face with this ball. So here goes. Safety first. things I do to keep the peace around here. In this video, we're going to talk about DNA replication. We talked about nucleotide synthesis in the last video, and now we're going to take those nucleotides and put them to use to replicate DNA. So DNA replication is a very complex, tightly regulated process. You need to make a pristine copy of the genetic code. We can't afford to get sloppy and make mistakes because that introduces mutations. But mistakes do happen, so we're going to talk about some DNA repair mechanisms and some diseases that occur when you can't repair DNA. So let's start with DNA replication. DNA replication begins at very specific sites called origins of replication, where DNA starts to unwind, and this forms a Y-shaped area that's called the replication fork. So take a look at this diagram, which is also at number four in your study guide. The first thing I want to call your attention to is an enzyme called helicase. Helicase starts to unwind the DNA. And there are some other proteins called single-strand binding proteins that bind to the individual strands and keep them from re-annealing. So they stabilize the unwound DNA, so to speak. So they're going to keep the strands apart so the polymerase can come in and do its job. As helicase unwinds the DNA, that causes the downstream DNA to become supercoiled. Like if you were to take a braided rope and start pulling the individual strands apart, that downstream piece of rope starts to coil up on itself. And that's no good for DNA. So there's an enzyme called topoisomerase, which nicks the downstream DNA helix to relieve those supercoils. Now, what was the class of antibiotics that inhibits prokaryotic topoisomerase? It's fluoroquinolones. And there's also an anti-cancer drug called etoposide that inhibits eukaryotic topoisomerase. And when you inhibit topoisomerase, you can't replicate DNA, and the cell can't divide. One other thing to remember about topoisomerase is that there's an autoantibody to topoisomerase. Remember what that autoantibody was called? Anti-SCL70, which is associated with diffuse scleroderma. Not crest scleroderma, but the more severe diffuse scleroderma. What was the antibody for crest scleroderma? It was anti-centromere antibodies. Once you've got the DNA unwound a little bit, you can start replicating. So the enzymes that do the actual replication are called DNA polymerases. But there's something you need before the polymerases, which is a little piece of starter RNA called an RNA primer. 
In prokaryotes, the DNA polymerase can't start from scratch, so there's an enzyme called primase that lays down this little RNA primer. So this diagram represents prokaryotic DNA replication. In prokaryotes, there are a couple of different kinds of DNA polymerase. There's DNA polymerase 3, which replicates the DNA on the leading strand. So DNA and RNA are always synthesized from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. For that matter, if you're writing a sequence of DNA, you always write the sequence from 5' prime to 3'. Prime. So the leading strand is the strand that runs 5' prime to 3'. Prime, and that means that DNA polymerase 3 can build this strand continuously. But on the other strand of DNA, which we call the lagging strand, the 5' prime end starts at the replication fork, which means that you have to let the DNA unwind a little bit, then replicate a very short piece of DNA, then go back to the replication fork, which is moved downstream as the DNA unwinds a little bit more. And the helicase has unwound a little more DNA, and then the primase makes a new RNA primer, and the polymerase builds another little piece of DNA up to the previous RNA primer. So on the lagging strand, DNA is replicated in short, discontinuous segments called Okazaki fragments. And again, in prokaryotes, it's DNA polymerase 3 that replicates both the leading strand and the lagging strand. That's not the case in eukaryotes, which we're going to see in a moment. So what do you do with all these little Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand? Well, there's a different polymerase called DNA polymerase 1 that breaks down the RNA primer, and then it fills in the gaps with DNA. And then another enzyme called DNA ligase joins the Okazaki fragments together. So make sure you know all those prokaryotic polymerases. Then, to make things even more confusing, in eukaryotes you have a completely different set of polymerases with similar but slightly different functions. Eukaryotes have DNA polymerase alpha, which is capable of making its own primer, so you don't need a separate primase in eukaryotes. DNA polymerase alpha also builds the Okazaki fragments on the lagging strand, but over on the leading strand you have a different enzyme called DNA polymerase delta that builds the leading strand. And there's one called DNA polymerase beta, which is basically involved in DNA repair. And there's also DNA polymerase gamma, which replicates mitochondrial DNA. So if you haven't already filled in the answers to number four in your study guide, which again is prokaryotic DNA replication, pause the video and answer those, and then I'll give you the answers. So A is a structure called a primosome, which is a complex of DNA helicase and primase. So those two together make the primosome. B is DNA helicase. C is primase. D is a single strand binding protein and those help to stabilize DNA until a complementary strand can be synthesized. E is DNA polymerase 3 on the leading strand. And then F is also DNA polymerase 3 on the lagging strand. And again, in prokaryotes, the same type of polymerase, DNA polymerase 3, builds both the leading strand and the lagging strand. And then G is the RNA primer on the lagging strand, which is made by primase. H is an Okazaki fragment. And I is DNA ligase. Now let's talk about some different ways that genetic mutations can occur. You can have a silent mutation where the genetic code changes, but it still codes for the same amino acid, so the final polypeptide is unchanged. So there's a mutation, but from a functional perspective, it's silent. This is possible because the genetic code is redundant, and there are multiple codons for most amino acids. It's often the third base in the codon triplet that's variable. For example, if the first two bases are cytosine, cytosine, that's going to code for the amino acid proline, regardless of what the third base is. So if there's a single base change that happens to fall on the third base in that reading frame, it may not affect the protein product whatsoever. It's not always the case, but it does frequently happen. Another type of mutation is a missense mutation, where the mutation does change the amino acid sequence so that the polypeptide product has different structural or functional properties. Maybe the protein folds differently, and that makes it non-functional, or it just functions in a different way. For example, when we talk about sickle cell disease in hematology, we'll see that this usually results from a single mutation from GAG to GTG in one of the genes for hemoglobin. Now, GAG codes for glutamic acid, but GTG, or GUG on RNA, codes for valine. And that one little change in the amino acid sequence allows the final hemoglobin molecule to polymerize and make the red cells sickle. So it significantly changes the functional properties of the protein product. And a third type of mutation is the nonsense mutation. Now this is where the base substitution results in a stop codon. We're going to talk about start and stop codons again in the next video, but there are three very specific codons that signal the end of the amino acid chain. And if you mutate the DNA sequence so that the protein translation stops early, you might wind up with a polypeptide that was supposed to be 500 amino acids long, but it's, now it's only 100 amino acids long, so that's unlikely to be a functional protein. And then a frame shift mutation is where nucleotides are added or deleted, and the reading frame is shifted 
so that the downstream amino acid sequence is completely different. So look at this example. If the original non-mutated genetic code looked like this, the amino acid sequence would be this. But if you add a single base here, that completely shifts the reading frame so that the amino acid sequence is completely different. So that's a frame shift mutation. One last type of mutation is a pyrimidine dimer, which is where two pyrimidines, usually two thymines, on the same strand of DNA get covalently bonded together into a dimer. So this is how UV light damages DNA. It pairs thymine to thymine on the same strand of DNA. Now don't get confused, this is not pairing thymine to thymine on complementary strands of DNA. It's thymine to thymine on the same strand of DNA. And usually your body can recognize that mutation and fix it, but if you can't fix it, you're going to be very susceptible to genetic damage from exposure to UV light. So now let's talk about DNA repair. There are four basic DNA repair mechanisms that you need to be aware of. Mismatch repair, nucleotide excision repair, base excision repair, and something called non-homologous end joining. And the type of DNA damage or mutation that exists will determine which protein specialist needs to come in and patch things up. Now these first three are all mechanisms to repair a single DNA strand. Mitch mismatch repair is pretty straightforward. It's where the DNA has been replicated incorrectly so that the wrong base was dropped in. So there's a mismatch. So instead of a G pairing with a C on the daughter strand, the DNA polymerase accidentally stuck a T in there. Only T is not supposed to pair with a G. So there are enzymes that can recognize the mismatch and recognize which strand is the parent and which strand is the daughter. Then they nick the daughter strand upstream, remove a whole bunch of bases, not just the mismatch base, but a whole string of bases. And then they redo the replication and fill in the gap they created. Now, what if the DNA was replicated correctly, but it was damaged later on, like some UV radiation got to it and created one of those pyrimidine dimers? Well, in that case, you need to remove the damaged nucleotide and replace it with a new one. So this is called nucleotide excision repair, which means you're going to excise the entire nucleotide and then replace it. And the distinguishing thing about this repair mechanism is that it can recognize large, bulky areas of damage in the DNA. So imagine those thymines that have formed a dimer. That's going to change the shape of the DNA strand, and you can imagine it sort of causes a little bulge in the DNA. So uh, if there's a bulky mutation, you're going to use nucleotide excision repair. So the basic mechanism is that enzymes called endonucleases can make a nick in the DNA on either side of the damage, remove the damaged nucleotides, and then DNA polymerase can fill in the gaps. And then DNA ligase will join the fragments together. So there are three enzyme processes involved. One to remove the nucleotide, one to insert the new nucleotides, and one to seal up the gap. And then base excision repair actually adds a fourth step. Now base excision repair is used for non-bulky damage, or maybe just the base is damaged. Maybe the base lost an amino group. Maybe the base was oxidized or alkylated. Those types of damage to the bases aren't big and bulky. It's like the difference between a scratch in the paint job of your car versus a major dent. So with base excision repair, you're adding a fourth process, uh, which is to first remove the damaged base. So you're going to remove the damaged base. The enzymes that do this are called glycosylases. They remove that damaged base. Then you have an endonuclease that cuts the DNA backbone, removes the empty sugar from the backbone. Then polymerase fills in the gaps and ligase seals it. So four steps. Now, all three of those we've just talked about are repairing a single strand of DNA. But the fourth one, non-homologous end joining, is repairing both strands. So this is where there's a clean break in both strands of DNA, and you're simply gluing them back together. So you have two ends of DNA that kind of overhangs on both of those ends, and you bring them together and repair them. But you don't have a homologous strand that acts as a template to follow. So this is non-homologous end joining. Finally, let's briefly talk through a few diseases that result from defects in DNA repair. We talked about mismatch repair. Well, hereditary non-polyposis colorectal cancer, or HNPCC, is due to a mutation in a gene that codes for one of these mismatch repair proteins. So that increases the risk of colon cancer and also other cancers. Xeroderma pigmentosum is a disorder where you have a defect in nucleotide excision repair, which means you can't repair those pyrimidine dimers caused by UV light. So these patients have an increased risk of skin cancers, including melanoma, basal cell skin cancer, and squamous cell skin cancer. A somewhat similar disorder of DNA repair is called Bloom syndrome, which is actually a mutation of helicase. So this affects both DNA replication and DNA repair. But again, these patients have hypersensitivity to sunlight. 
They also have increased susceptibility to cancers like leukemias and lymphomas. They have a host of other problems like immunodeficiency and infertility and facial anomalies. But just recognize Bloom syndrome is a disease related to DNA repair defects. Then in terms of defects of repairing those double-stranded DNA breaks, one example of this would be ataxia telangiectasia. We talked about ataxia telangiectasia in immunology because it causes IgA deficiency. Remember, it causes cerebellar ataxia and poor smooth pursuit with the eyes. Also elevated AFP after eight months of age. And we said that these patients are sensitive to ionizing radiation because radiation damages the DNA and these patients aren't able to repair the damage. And then one last one is the BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, which cause breast cancer and ovarian cancer. These mutations actually disrupt another type of double-stranded DNA repair, not the same as the non-homologous end joining, but still dealing with that double-stranded DNA repair. So that's it for DNA replication and repair. Let's go ahead and do the end of session quiz. All right, let's get started. First question, what strand of DNA nucleotides opposes this DNA strand? So five prime, A, T, T, G, C, G, T, A, so three prime. So you may have been inclined to just pair your A's to T's and then pair your C's to G's and write it out as T, A, A, C, G, and so on. But that's incorrect because that's going from three prime to five prime. Remember, DNA is always written five prime to three prime. So the correct answer going from five prime to three prime is T, A, C, G, C, A, A, T. Now, we're not trying to trick you. I just want you, don't want you to be caught off guard if you see a question like this on your exam. Next, how does UV light damage DNA? It causes those pyrimidine dimers on the same strand of DNA, usually thymine to thymine, but it could be cytosine to cytosine. And the last one, what eukaryotic DNA polymerase matches each of the following descriptions? So replicates the lagging strand, that's DNA polymerase alpha. Synthesizes the RNA primer, that's also DNA polymerase alpha. Repairs DNA, that's DNA polymerase beta. Replicates mitochondrial DNA, is DNA polymerase gamma and replicates the leading strand DNA is DNA polymerase delta. So that's it for the end of session quiz. I'll see you next time. Good evening, students, and welcome back to Ask Dr. Acula. I, of course, am Dr. Acula. <laughs> Tonight's question comes to us from Kerry, a student from New York. Dear Dr. Acula, Love the show. What treatment is recommended for xeroderma pigmentosum? Great question, Kerry. As you know, xeroderma pigmentosum is an autosomal recessive genetic disorder of DNA repair, in which there is an inability to repair thymidine dimers caused by damage from UV rays. If left unchecked, this damage can cause mutations in the individual cell's DNA, which can affect proto-oncogenes, resulting in skin cancer. In extreme cases, treatment is avoiding all exposure to sunlight, which is why patients with this disorder are sometimes referred to as children of the night. <laughs> Great question, Carrie. And remember, studying doesn't have to suck. <sighs> <laughs>